love commit go deep. So tell me how deep is your love commit go deep. So tell me how deep is your love commit go deep. How deep is your love? All right, all right. Hey, everybody. Uh, just wanted to uh, welcome you to the Boys and Girls Club Design in the City event uh, this, this evening. Really excited. This really serves as the official kickoff for the Boys and Girls Club first ever industry club. We announced it a, a few months ago in partnership with Bedrock and Detroit is New Black. And the, the whole purpose of the industry club is to really give youth an immersive experience into specific industries. And in this case, it's the fashion and design industry. Um, the, the youth are and the students are really going to uh, learn the entire business model, the entire business cycle of fashion and design. So really what you're going to see today is just the first step. It's, it's just that design part of them uh, being, being able to, to design their t-shirt. And then this t-shirt is going to go on to uh, be produced. They'll learn how to market it, how to sell it, um, how to fulfill it from a logistic standpoint all of those good things. So this is really just step one. But for all the youth who are on, I really want them to acknowledge what's happening here today because you have a lot of adults and a lot of corporations and a lot of people leaning into you. Uh, and what they're saying to you is that I believe in you and I believe in your talent. And I think that that's really powerful. So I just wanna take a moment to recognize some of those individuals who are stepping in and stepping up to make sure that you have an amazing experience. Uh, first and foremost, of course, design in the city, uh, Bedrock, our uh, OG partner who helped uh, start this along with uh, Detroit is the New Black, Deviate, uh, have to recognize the Boys and Girls Club staff, they're fantastic, they're amazing. All of the panelists, uh, Peer Michigan, Detroit versus everybody, Tommy, uh, everyone in involved there. And I'm really excited to announce uh, one of our newest early adopters, which is AT&T, and uh, you'll hear from David Lewis a little bit later, but you know, AT&T, they're, they're, they're a big supporter of the community. They're doing a lot of amazing things already in the community. Uh, they saw what we were doing and what we were attempting to do, and um, they, they wanted to, to jump in. And so really excited to uh, welcome them as an early adopter and announce that they're gonna be providing $50,000 for, for, uh, for this initiative. So once again, I wanna welcome everyone. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kiana. Thank you so much, Sean. Hi, everybody. My name is Kiana Wenzel, and I am the Director of Culture and Community at Design Corps Detroit, which is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to establish Detroit as a globally recognized and valued capital for creative talent. So I am so happy to be here today 
in partnership with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Southeastern Michigan and Bedrock. Our three organizations were brought together through my work with the Bedrock team and Kiara May, shout out to Kiara, um, on a program called Design in the City. Design in the City is a platform for emerging fashion and accessory designers to showcase and build awareness of their work while receiving mentorship from an industry advisory council made up of local and global leaders in the fashion industry. The program pairs 12 fashion and accessory designers, prioritizing women and designers of color with commercial spaces to host installations of their work during the 10th annual Detroit Month of Design, which ends September 30th. In addition to showcasing their work, the designers are also offered business and marketing support, technical assistance, and distribution opportunities. Design in the City is made possible by a grant from Gucci North America and its Change Makers Impact Fund with additional support from Bedrock. Therese Clark, one of the panelists today, was selected to participate in the Design in the City program. So you will hear more from her. Her installation titled Her Hue is located at a bedrock space on Library Street. Cassidy Tucker from Deviate also participated in Design in the City and had a trunk show and month long pop up at Simply Casual, a clothing store owned by Rufus Bartell, another one of the panelists today. While working on Design in the City with Kiara and the bedrock team, we began to draw parallels between the industry club and design in the city. Because we know that in order to have Detroit seen as a global creative capital, we need healthy growing businesses that are a reflection of our community and businesses that embrace the values of collaboration, accessibility, and diversity. And what better way to ensure that future than to focus on educating, supporting, and training our young people and emerging designers. Opportunities in industrial sewing and manufacturing, e-commerce and merchandising are growing in this region. However, many of the aspiring designers in Detroit haven't had the mentorship, business support, and training needed to equally compete for some of the opportunities that are coming down the pipeline. That is why programs like the Industry Club and design in the city are so important. And I'm happy and Design Corps is happy to collaborate and support this work. I will now turn the program over to our two youth members, Miles and Mackenzie, who will moderate the panel discussion. But first, a few housekeeping items. There should be a chat box that you can use for dropping comments or links. Also, there's a Q&A button or if you have a question, you can put it in there and we'll answer all questions after the panel discussion. So, Miles and McKenzie, are you ready? Yes, we are. All right, handing it over to you. Yes, we are. Good evening, everyone. So, our first panelist is Rufus Bartell, who is the owner of Simply Casual Clothing, a long ring men's and women's clothing boutique on the historic avenue of fashion. Simply Casual is one of the five pop-up locations for the Design in the City program. Our next panelist is Therese Clark, a mom, maker, and all-around DIY enthusiast. Referenced to as Detroit's handywoman by CBS, she fabricates branded photo opportunities for live, picture-worthy moments. Therese is a winner of the Design in the City competition. Her installation titled Her Hue is now on display through September 30th at 1232 Library Street, Library Street. Our third panelist, Rosalyn Karamoko, founder of Detroit of the New Black and one of the early supporters of the Industry Club program. The inaugural program will be held in her venue at Detroit of the New Black space on Woodward Avenue. Our fourth panelist is Tommy Walker, a Detroiter through and through and graphic artist by trade, Detroit versus everybody. Founder Tommy Walker Jr. embodies the spirit of Detroit with his hustle and grind. 
He founded Detroit versus Everybody in 2012 to combat the media's bashing and lack of cultural recognition for the place that has contributed so much to the world. Our last panelist is Jordan Sims, a representative from Ind Industrial Sewing and Innovation Center, a Detroit-based nonprofit. It is a national resource for those committed to a positive impact through responsible production of high quality garments and provide solutions centered around people, education, advanced manufacturing, and upward mobility for workers. I'm gonna hand it over to Miles for the first question. So our first question for the panel, what made you decide to become a designer or an entrepreneur and how old were you? Well, I, I, um, I wouldn't say that it, it was like a choice. Um, I, I began in dabbling in entrepreneurship uh, in like uh, elementary school. Uh, so, you know, you have, um, you go get fast food and they would have like, you know, you, I, I had a junk drawer in which I would put all my toys from like Burger King or like McDonald's and like, uh, you know, like slingshots and everything that uh, I would get, I just collect. I had a junk drawer underneath my TV. And I would just call, I would call my classmates. I had all their, their numbers and I would call them and be like, hey, I got this yo-yo, you know what I'm saying? You want it for, for $2, do you want it? After I was done with it. And then I would just sell my things like that, you know, just uh, like a lot of people like to like to call it hustling, but it was a uh, dabbling in entrepreneurship, you know? And um, that uh, that was when I first, uh, uh, began. So I think, you know, it was, it was something that I just had, just the ambition was, um, just a part of who I was. I'll jump in. Um, so same for me, you know, it wasn't really a choice. It just seems like something I've been doing, um, innately for, for a long time. I remember when I was in elementary school, my grandma had, um, kind of like a social club that would come over to her house. They would play cards and they would raise money for the local hospital. And so within their little club, they had like a treasurer and a secretary and, you know, a president. And so I remember going to school and just like organizing a little, you know, an organization or really a, a company, you know, so who's, who's in charge of this, who's in charge of the money, who takes the notes. So I just remember from very early on organizing a team um, and then as I sort of went into middle school you know we would have different bake sales and um, things at school where we'd raise money for the cheerleading team or whatever it was I was on and I remember being really competitive about um, those events you know I, I'd know how much we sold that day I'd know how much it cost us so I'm looking at our profit margins and how successful were we that day and all that so just very early I've been looking at how do you organize a business and how do you make money doing it? So that was kind of my, um, you know, introduction to entrepreneurship. Uh, so for me, um, you know, coming from a long line of business owners uh, in my family, so I kind of grew up in it. Uh, tons of brothers, uncles, mom and dad. Um, more importantly, you know, I get I got bit by the fashion bug probably uh, junior high school going into uh, high school. But uh, uh, as Tommy said, you know, everybody had a hustle growing up in my neighborhood. And for me, I was throwing handbills. I was shoveling snow. I was cutting grass. And I was getting good at it. So I kept a knot in my pocket. You know, if I had $30, $40 in my pocket, that was a lot of money. And I had, I made sure I had all singles, too, to make it look like I had a lot of money. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, so, you know, members of, up and down the street used to hire me because I was very good in, in cutting lawn. I was very meticulous about it. And then uh, I got into, uh, I was painting houses because my dad was a painter, you know, as, as part of one of his second jobs. And um, I really enjoyed painting because, you know, there's a lot of creativity and that kind of helped, you know, feed my creativity. And so I began to paint houses uh, in the neighborhood. So everything I'd, I'd done from an entrepreneur standpoint was right in my neighborhood. And for me, I started, um making jewelry in about elementary school. And I uh, turned it kind of into a business more towards middle school. And I would sell bracelets and necklace sets. Uh, my grandmother, she worked for the city of Detroit. So I would send things to the mayor's office with her. My mom worked at a hospital. So 
I would send things to the nurse's floor with her just so I could buy Jordans. So really my entrepreneurship journey started because I wanted to buy all of the gym shoes that came out really. <laughs> um, and for me, I would say, you know, it's, my story is a little bit different. Uh, I kind of wanted to go into a completely different industry. Um, so I actually moved to LA after I graduated college to try um, and be a part of the entertainment industry out there. And it just was not meshing well with me. And, you know, everyone would always say, your style is so cute. You know, you have really good um, uh, fashion sense. Like you should really go into fashion. And I just thought to myself, oh, I don't really know. You know, there were um, some qualms about going into the fashion industry. So I had reservations about it. But at about 22, 23, I basically decided to do a full dive when the entertainment industry wasn't working out for me. Um, and I went to fit them out in Los Angeles. And um, that was kind of how everything birthed for me. Um, so I would just also make sure to say that let this decision be yours as well. And don't let everyone push it on you, you know, let it be something that really resonates with you. Nice. So our second question is, what's the most memorable point in your career and why? Um, I'll start this one out. Um, I would probably say my most um, memorable point in my career was being hired at Ralph Lauren. So I worked at Ralph Lauren, um, I left about a year ago and I was there for about two years. And it was probably one of those like rites of passage, working in the New York office, um, being a part of the design team. I mean, it was a great, great experience and you learn so much. And, you know, I say it's a bit of a rites of passage because so many fashion designers have gone through Ralph Lauren to, um, you know, start their own lines. Uh, so for me, um, I had a development deal in Pontiac. I was uh, 26, 27 years old, had a 20,000 square foot building in Pontiac and uh, was trying to develop it into a multi-purpose space, you know, leading with fashion. Uh, certainly bit off more than I can chew. All the money that I had made in real estate, I had rolled into that. All the money I begged and borrowed from friends and family, I rolled into that building and I lost my shirt. And one of the reasons I lost my shirt is, is that um, I was still learning the real estate game and I didn't negotiate a strong enough lease. Um, and there was a very seasoned uh, real estate professional that I was dealing with who happened to own the building and he took advantage of us. And um, he ended up striking a deal with the hospital and they sold the building from under me. I was crushed. It took me about uh, two years to recover, but uh, I learned a very, very, very valuable lesson and I haven't looked back since. That's great, Rufus. Thank you for that. You know, and I, I can, I can um, sort of relate. You know, I think one of my my proudest moments is really opening um, this store on Woodward Avenue and just sort of being in you know position amongst national retail um, on either side and across the street. It's really a dream. I remember moving to Detroit back in 2013 and coming down Woodward Avenue, and there was really nothing here. But I remember thinking in my head, I'm going to have a store on that street. I'm going to be, it's going to be like Chanel in Paris, you know, and it, I just, I claimed it and it really manifested. And so I feel, I feel so blessed and humbled to be in this position. Um, but it is a huge responsibility. And to Rufus point, you know, to go into something that you may not really understand all the moving parts or sort of what it takes to really maintain that, you know, it can take you to, play, to a place that can, um, you can almost lose, you know, you really can almost lose. So I think it's been one of my greatest blessings, but also one of my greatest challenges to, um, to maintain this space. And I know it's important, um, you know, youth like the Boys and Girls Club, the Industry Club, this is why we're here. This is why we're doing it. Um, and that just drives me and motivates me to, to, to keep it here and make sure that um, we have a presence. What was the question again? It was the pivotal, <laughs> most pivotal moment in my career. Most what was your most memorable moment in your career and why? Um, the most memorable moment in my career that I remember uh, is maybe, is when I found Illustrator, the Illustrator pen tool. When I found 
the Illustrator pen tool and figured out how to use the Illustrator pen tool, the whole world opened up to me. And, and that was it. That way I could create anything that I wanted, anything that I thought of, anything that I saw, I could create. And I became a bad man that day. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up tools, Tommy, because definitely when I learned about a jigsaw, things definitely pivoted for me because I was spending a lot of money um, buying custom signage for things. So when I learned how to use a jigsaw and make my own cutout wooden letters or wooden art from that, it saved me so much money that I was able to experiment other things to take my career further to invest more in myself. So I would definitely say finding that tool as well as uh, last year uh, working with Create and Cultivate, which is a really huge traveling conference because I learned so much in such a little time. Um, I've spent a three day weekend with them and really building everything um, on site from scratch was really big moments for me. I got one more too. Also, I got two more. One when, um, uh, uh, Keith Urban wore us on American Idol. That was, a, that was a pivotal moment for my brand and for my career. And when we had, and when we uh, got the end of Detroit versus everybody song too. That was a, that was a, that was a crazy moment that's, that has like snowballed to like present day. That's crazy. Yeah, that's it. The next question is, what was the best piece of your of career advice given to you? Oh, I got that. <laughs> best, piece of career, best piece of career advice. Hey, look, look, this is the best piece of career advice that I got. They said, hey, what's the best way to eat an elephant? And I said, I don't know. And he said, one bite at a time. And, I, and my mind just blew up. It's like everything that you're looking at if you're looking at a mountain, it's you looking at it as a mountain, but, but, but if you look at it as 20 million little rocks, you, you got a different, you got a different, you know, idea of it. Like I was saying, now I got to pick up, you look at, I got to pick up this big mountain. It looks different, but hey, I got to pick up these 20,000 rocks. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's a, it's a different reality. But like, what's the best way to, to, to attack any large task, any large doing? is to look at it as a as a series of small goals and then you just get to work knocking out those small goals and what you find out is you're enjoying the ride and then you're there and you're done and you're like okay what's next so for me you know my advice came from my mother and it was similar to uh tommy and she used to always say and i have a and if you guys get to know me and hang around me enough i'm, I'm gonna quote my mother and follow you know a couple of times a week <laughs> because they kind of like instill so much um, and so much knowledge. Uh, you know, I come from a very large family of 14 and my mom and dad was married 69 years. And so over that time, they've gained a lot of knowledge. She used to always say Rome wasn't built in a day. And so in college, I used to try to zoom through everything. You know, I wanted it done yesterday. I wanted to be rich in two minutes. And she used to always remind me Rome wasn't built in a day. And then I began to understand what she meant by that. And what she meant by that was take your time. You'll make less mistakes. And then if you want to go fast, uh, go by yourself. If you want to go far, take people with you. So, uh, you know, I've, I've used that um, my whole life. And, and let me also submit this. And this is, you know, one of my own. And I think you'll find this if you use it to be hugely uh, uh, beneficial throughout your whole career. And that is, I have these three core beliefs or these three core values. One, you help people get where you want to, if you help people get where you want to go, you all make get where you want to go. Two, anything left in depth can be worked out. And then three, you create a circle and then you increase the size of that circle. Oftentimes what we do, we do the reverse. We create a circle and then we make it exclusive. And that exclusive circle dies off or the information doesn't come in or you only got a small army. No, I want a big army. And so you want to increase the size of that circle. And, and, and uh, that circle obviously have to be impactful, but you certainly want to increase the size of the circle. So those three things are my core value. And I think if you adopt them, they'll pay dividends as well. I know this ain't, hold on, I don't know, I'm a panelist. 
The second one, you said every everything. What was the second one? The second one is if you help somebody up, no, anything less than death can be worked out. Woo! I like that. I like that. <laughs> no, that's heat for real. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's powerful. Yeah, that is. That's strong. That's, that's, that's awesome. That's, awesome. That's, yeah. That's, that's strong to go after, but I, I'll go. Um, early on, you know, I think, I think I've approached entrepreneurship and, and um, you know, my parents always told me this and it's um, own yourself and don't do anything you don't want to do, you know, and entrepreneurship seems like, you know, something you can, um, it, it's, it's really you designing your life. You're designing the life that you want to live. And so you have to determine who you are and why you're doing it and what you're doing it for. And as you may grow or may bring in different partners or different influences or different um, people that may want to change the direction of that. But if you always own yourself and don't do anything you don't want to do, then at the end of the day, you only attract those people um, that are in line with your mission. On the other side of that, though, you may sacrifice certain things and, and there may, may be some things that don't happen because you've decided that that's not what you want to do but if you take ownership of yourself um you know no one no one has control of you or or your message and that for me has been really important throughout my career especially for young women own yourself you own yourself you're smart and you're in charge of yourself that's great Razlin. i definitely um i think for me the best piece of advice i can give i would say um, not even more so from an entrepreneur uh, standpoint, but more so from an artist, is just to make creating an everyday practice. So just like you're brushing your teeth, you need to be making something every day. Maybe not a finished product, but at least picking up a pencil, putting it to paper, doing something with that, that's a step daily, for sure. That's awesome. I would definitely, definitely agree with that. Um, I would say that my greatest um, piece of advice that was given to me it kind of came to me more so fairly recently. So um, a mentor actually quoted a Winston Churchill quote that's basically that it basically says success is the, the ability to go from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And this truly changed my perception of what success meant because a lot of people think that failing is bad when it's not. It's more so the staying down part that'll really um, crutch you. So remember just to continue to pick yourself back up again and that it is okay to fail because ultimately that's gonna lead to your success. Uh, really great advice from all the panelists. Um, but now seeing that, you know, you all started your businesses or your, your entrepreneur, the, the fashion bug, you know, bit you all fairly early. Um, what do you believe youth can start doing today to start their journey to becoming a designer? Whatever they feel, like whatever they, whatever it is that is in creation that they feel pulled to. It's like you, the key word you said was youth. So it's like that's one thing that I really, 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 really love and appreciate my mother for because. It wasn't no downtime for me. She put me in everything. I'm talking about I was doing paper mache. I was doing ballet, tap, jazz, <laughs> golf, baseball, football, soccer, tennis. Like, like, like I did it all. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, um, I'm talking about dap set, like school, Sunday school, choir, you know what I'm saying? Uh fishing. Um uh, she was just trying to get you out the house. <laughs> I'm no, 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 that's what that's, at the time, but no. But I thought what she was doing was she was get, getting my hand, try, getting my hands dirty and everything. Let me see what it was that I liked. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it was it was a method to her madness that I appreciate because I gave her a hard time. You know what I'm saying? And then and she was just trying to to uh, put me out there to see to get let me see what what I was capable of. So I'm saying just get out there, just look around. If it's something that that you like, that you see, that you like, Google it. How do I do this? You know what I'm saying? Like, what's the process behind this? If it's somebody that you see doing something that you like, go walk up to, to them. Seriously, it's that simple. Hey, what's up? I like what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? It's interesting. You know, can I have, can I, you know, you got a second to answer the question. Like, like you maybe figure out a, a way to, a better way to deliver it, you know, but what I'm saying is that just go for it. 
whatever it is. Now with the creative stuff, the more you do, the more you find out what you like and what you don't like. And then you start slimming down your preferences until find, one, finally you're like, oh, okay. I know I like music. I done did all these 12 instruments, but the one that stuck with me was piano. So I'm about to hone in on piano. You know what I'm saying? So it's like just at, in, in your youth, just be playful. Just anything that your spirit pulls you to, anything that you're interested in, just, just dive into it because it might be for you. I think that's great. And I think, you know, to that point, Tommy, it's like as you do more things, as you're involved in more things, you gain a network and people that are going to support you whenever you choose what path you want to go on. And, and that that network, we used to call it a Rolodex. That's really just your phone and people that are in your phone. So you want to make sure once you decide what it is you, you want to do, there's someone that can support you or point you in that right direction. So to more and more in that network that can connect you to to that next thing is is really i think important as you as you develop your career it's definitely uh the network and your village and community too i will say don't think that you need to go out and buy everything just because you're interested in a certain medium i will say use what you have first so that's what i'm into uh definitely do it yourself things deconstructing things putting them back together you can definitely make new things out of old things. Creativity comes in those, those places of lack sometimes as well. So for me, you know, one of my best advice I will always give is, you know, follow your passion and make sure there's a need for your passion. Mm. And if you're lucky, work and play feels the same. For me, work and play feels the same. I don't work. And that sounds crazy, right? It's because I'm at play. And I've kind of constructed my life over time where the things that I enjoy work is the things I also enjoy, uh, enjoy for play. And that's very intentional. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It happens by years of, of lining up things and uh, training your mind to see things differently. And oftentimes we talk about what it is that we have to do. It's not necessarily what we have to do, but rather who we have to become. And it's the becoming that gets us where we need to go. But you have to train your mind and you got to work on training your mind to think differently and, and think beyond what you think you can do. And so um, whether it be design, whether it be whatever business that you have. And like for me, I both design, but I, I do it freelance. I don't I don't illustrate, however. And, and uh, I tell people all the time, fashion is not about uh, what you wear, it's about how you feel. And that's the genesis for me when you start talking about fashion. How do you feel about it? You know, you know how somebody can wear something that somebody else can't wear? I don't have anything to do with style or whether or not this guy got the swag or this girl got the swag to wear it. It's about do you got the confidence of wearing it? Fashion is about how you feel, not what you wear. Um, I think everyone gave pretty much, I mean, everyone gave great advice on where, you know, you can start. Um, I would just piggyback off of what everyone's saying and saying, just get interested and do your research. Um, as a fashion industry overall, um, one of the things that I actually learned is that you don't have to have a degree in fashion merchandising or design to be in the fashion industry. You know, there are many different career paths that you can take whether it be you're interested in engineering, whether it be you're interested in technology or marketing or communications, there's a space there for so many different fields. So I would just say to also broaden your scope when researching what you might want to do within the industry. Oh, that's great. So it looks like we only have time for one more question and then we're going to open up the Q&A and chat box. So our last question is, what have you found most challenging about being in the fashion industry? Is it challenging? Yeah, what have you found most challenging about being in the fashion industry? Oh, uh, I say, I say that um, um, I mean, just life is a challenge. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, I'm not gonna say the fashion industry is challenging. Like, it's just, it's all the challenge. 
But I will say the challenge that I'm fighting so much, like I've been fighting for eight years that never stops, is the um, trademark infringement. That's 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 the that that's the heartbreaking. That's the heartbreaking um, fight. It was two fights. I had my heart broken with um, trademark infringement, and I had my heart broken with uh, shrinkage and like uh, theft, like how much people steal. Like when I, I when I opened up a business in retail. And I saw that, oh man, everybody's stealing. It's like, oh my, oh my God, this is, this. it was a heartbroken situation to see, how, to, to think about how much, like how much you have to protect yourself against thieves. Like you gotta, you gotta think like a thief to protect yourself against thieves. It's crazy, but those were like the two heartbreaking moments that I had in my career. Can, can I add something? And I'm not, I won't answer the question, but I want to, uh, speak to uh to Tommy about this you know there's a thing in retail that says um everybody's going to steal you just got to control how much they steal mm -hmm. give me an example by that let's say you got a salesperson that brings in a hundred dollars a week mm -hmm. and that person sells great and you think the person's stealing you're not exactly sure but you got an honest person right mm -hmm. that brings in twenty dollars a week mm -hmm. the question becomes who do you keep Right. So it's, it's, it's math. And so and so we had to I, I had to get out of my feelings the first time that happened to me some 20 years ago. Right. Yeah. It's because what's I'll get rid of that person for another person that's going to steal. Right. In an all cash business or in a cash business, the assumption is that everybody steal. We're just going to control how much you steal. Right. And, and, and to learn that lesson was a hard one. You know what I'm saying? Like on on a on a on an employee end and on the customer end, everybody yeah. trying to get you. It's like oh, it's like okay. You know right. what I'm saying? And once you once you once you get slapped, it's like okay, game on because you got it's, it's plenty of ways to prevent it. But you know, you being right a righteous being, not a thief, walking to it like oh, everybody trying to steal from me. Like okay, you know, like it, it, that's what it, that's what that was one of the biggest challenges that I had. I agree. I, th I think for me, it's been so so there's art and then there's fashion design and, and fashion design most likely is is for commercial purposes and to be sold. So I think what's been challenging for me is or just is challenging is that people want to be different, but not that different. And if you want to sell a lot of something, it has to resonate and make sense for a lot of people. So that means you know your creation or what you think it might be or what you think it, it might um it should look like it may not be what everyone thinks it should look like or a lot of people so it's like it's like trying to be different or trying to you know or wanting to push push the envelope or be who you are but also making sure that fits within somewhere in the retail space or some commercial space so that there's some sellability to it um so i think that constant balance of you know creation and commercial um art or you know commercial fashion i think is is a constant balance i understand that i would say for me more on the um artist end the biggest thing for me is trying to make sure i keep that individual voice that I'm not pulling too much inspiration from other places and regurgitating that back out into the world. I definitely um, don't wanna be influenced so much by what I see that I'm not being myself and I'm only doing what I see. So that would be like the hardest part for me is just to remain the individual that you are uninfluenced. I, I think it depends on what your goal is. You know, we are in the fashion business show business. Too many of us is so far over the art that we don't do any business. And so there's a delicate balance. There's a smart mix that has to happen. And certainly you want to be creative. But if the world says, I want a, a pink sweater and you just want to give them blue, and it's proven that they want to sweep a pink sweater, and you just keep giving them blue because you want to be different. I'm not sure how smart that is. So what I'm saying to you is, is that uh, the hardest thing for me in fashion is that you know I'm a real estate developer, right? As well, and I find in, in, in hospitality is the other space that I'm in. I find retail more complex than both of those lanes I just talked about, because the retail game looks simple, but it's complex. 
and it's ever moving. It's an ever moving target. So you'll see the tip of the iceberg, but it's a bunch of stuff below. And when everybody gets in the business, all they look at is that little iceberg that's sticking above water, but they don't see this behemoth under the, under the water. And so the hardest thing for me is keeping up with trends and keeping inventory levels and buying the right way and buying the right time and knowing how to buy and when to buy. Those things are complex because it's constantly changing. In retail, and, and I'm sure uh, uh, Rosalind and, uh, and Tommy, you're gonna know what I'm saying. You gotta make, you gotta, you gotta make money before you, before you ever, I mean, you have to make money on the buy, not to sell, if you understand what I'm saying. In other words, you have to buy well. And when you buy well, you can sell well. Right. But if you don't buy well, it don't matter how many widgets you sell, you're not selling well because your margins aren't there. So you're either going to have speed, meaning you're going to move something real fast, or you're going to have margins, something to have a lot of space in between and, 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 and profit margin. So it's about that delicate balance between all these moving plates. And these moving plates never stop. They constantly spin. That's what makes the garment industry more complex than what will perceive to be you know, a, a, let's say you're doing a development deal. That's math and that's money. Retail is more than just math and money. It's how you feel about something. It's emotional. It got all these other uh, factors that you have to negotiate in order to be good at this business. And that's why you got to leave with your passion. Got to give you the, the, the energy and the fortitude to keep going. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you definitely hit the nail on the head right there. Um, for me, I would kind of say what's just challenging about the industry overall is just the constraints that the industry has. I mean, economically, the fashion industry is always the first to go when the economy is not right. So, I mean, I was told very early on in my career that the, the industry kind of works like a rubber band where it expands and extends until it snaps back. And it happens about every eight years. Now things are changing due to COVID and the pandemic and everything that's happening. But I mean, I think that's probably one of the most challenging things about the industry over and overall is economically. If people aren't willing to spend, how do you make? I'm sorry, I missed that last part. What was I the mean, last question I missed at? Oh no, it, I was just basically saying that, you know, if you know, consumers are refusing to spend, how do you make? That was just one of the things that I feel are the most challenging things about yeah, this. You have to pivot, you know? man. You gotta, you gotta pivot. <laughs> you know, you gotta you, you know, you gotta be across a, a couple of you know, I think just, too, I think too, you know, sorry to jump in, but I think too is like establishing like your brand is bigger than your merchandise really you know so it's like you may start with you know one p item or one piece of clothes or one pro you know product but if someone is buying your customers buying into your brand so if they don't want you know t-shirts anymore what can the brand create that's more relevant in that moment that that customer will still respond to so it's building you know that that demand or building that larger network or community that wants to support or wants to be a part, part of that brand um i think is what you know allows you to sort of navigate those times when the economy is not um, not as um, you know expansive at that moment. Well, thank you all. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Um, we really appreciate your insight. Um, Really quickly, um, if any of the attendees have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, let's see. Any questions? Go ahead and drop them in the chat. I don't. So um, I think we have we have one question um, from Miss Orr. She says, Rufus, could you speak on training your mind in reference to becoming an entrepreneur? Okay, I got that. Thank you. Uh, yes, you know, training your mind is very, uh, very uh, important. And you do that uh, through personal development. And personal development says, you know, make YouTube your best friend. 
You can find so many scholars. You can find so many people who've done things that you're doing. Uh, so many help uh, videos and lectures uh, that helps to train your mind. Um, you know, the one thing I tell people all the time when they start a business, regardless of what business they start, the thing that you have in common with your business is you. And so that business is going to be good or, or as good or as bad as what you know and what you're able to leverage. And so oftentimes the question becomes, if you got a person, say, for example, they want to lose 20 pounds and they want to go to the gym. So the question becomes, who do you have to be to get up at six o'clock to go to the gym to be to work at eight o'clock? It's not what you have to do, it's who do you have to become? And that's very, very important. Robert Kiyosaki talks about that in his cash flow quadrant. Um, he's a real estate guru, but people think that he's talking about real estate, so they don't listen to Robert Kiyosaki. No, he's talking about a mindset. You need the same mindset, whether you're selling widgets in the restaurant business, no matter what business you're in, it's about what your mindset, who you are at the core. The unfortunate news is that some of our bad habits and paradigms we had for a very long time. The good news is that we can change it, but we gotta be willing to change it over time. And one of the things that we can do, oftentimes we don't have multiple panels like this on an ongoing basis, or you can't talk directly to a guru, but you can on YouTube. Yeah, definitely. I stand on that. They call it YouTube University. Absolutely. <laughs> but, um, and I think we have one more question. Um, the Wilson Clubs asks, what's next for you all's brands? Mm -hmm. Survey must be completed. I got a few. Uh, I'll go. Oh, go ahead, Tommy. <laughs> I, got a, I, got a, I got a couple projects. Um, I can't speak on, you know, those are the exciting ones. So I got some exciting stuff on the deck. <laughs> I got some exciting stuff as long as, and, and you know, always being creative. I got more drops. I got, you know, this is about to be a heavy month too. I think for me, it's 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 whatever the world needs from us, whatever the moment requires. You know, in this in this season, I I really think I'm I'm more interested and better at experiences. You know, and it's like me trying to determine. You know, what is the retail experience? What is the community experience? What is the um, black experience in retail? I think you know this this um, this collective or sort of this. Um, retail accelerator piece is really interesting to me. So uh, we have a few things sort of in the works and we'll just kind of see where that where that takes us. Oh, so you're not gonna tip your hand? <laughs> uh, we got quite a few things that we're doing. Um, certainly you gotta take the fifth uh, on this because you wanna make sure, you know, your, your I's are down, your T's crossing this position before you start speaking on it. But we're gonna be doing some uh, expansion in, in the retail space um on the in the live noise corridor and some other areas uh so uh detroit has a lot of pent-up demand it has a lot of retail gaps and uh so don't feel discouraged uh for people who are not finding their footprint keep looking and, I, and let me say this and i know this question wasn't at wasn't asked but one of the most important thing that a retailer can do uh when you talk about brick and mortar is understand what real estate is because you got to understand some, everything we do have a real estate implication, whether it's your house, whether you're doing business out of your garage, whether you're doing business offline because you're in your basement, whether you're in your office or whether you're in your warehouse, everything has a real estate implication. And what creators have a tendency of doing is not learning that part of the business. And it's hard to get out of a bad real estate deal. And that's what mostly sinks people is the bad real estate deal. So I know enough about real estate. I'm not saying you need to become an expert, now, I got a number of years in it. What happened to me when I was 26 would never happen to me again. However, that don't mean you need to be an expert. You need to know enough so you'll know what questions to ask for someone who can help you. So even though you may be a designer or a retailer, start thinking real estate. And if I can give you guys some homework, I'll say uh, go to YouTube, look up Robert Kiyosaki. He has a lot of videos, but the ones I want you to hone in on is the cash flow quadrant. That's going to be very, very, very important. And if you do that, you'll see that it'll act as a foundation and platform for whatever it is that you're trying to do.
Well, we certainly enjoy all the time that you guys have dedicated to this panel, and we want to thank you all for coming. Um, and now I'm going to throw it back over to Sean. All right, all right. So first, let me uh, let me acknowledge our Boys and Girls Club youth. You guys crushed it. Miles, Michaela, McKenzie, you, died, you guys did a, a fantastic job. So first and foremost, nice work on that. And then, of course, our panelists, you know, for a moment, I forgot that uh, the panel was for the kids. Uh, I was so, you know, I was paying so much attention, taking taking notes myself. Um, so that was fantastic. Thank you to all of the panelists for, for leaning in. And, um, you know, I, I just want to say this. I want to reiterate what I said in the beginning to our youth, because we have youth watching from all of our clubs. You know, this is an all-star lineup of people who are, who are leaning into you guys who are uh, leaning into you guys. And at the end of the day, you know, what we're trying to do is ensure that all of our youth are career, uh, startup and homeowner ready and programs like this really help to do that. But we can't do that without program partners and we can't do that without funding. Um, and next you're gonna meet a couple of those key uh, influential people. I've mentioned that Bedrock was at the table from day one on the industry club that Detroit is a new Black and Roslyn. They really helped to craft this, this program. Uh, but Deviate came in, and I'm going to turn it over to them in a minute. And they really took the bull by the horns. I mean, they really helped to design this and give it a level of authenticity uh, that, you know, is, is extraordinary. So I'm going to introduce them in a minute. But, but also it takes funding. Anytime we start up something new, we have to have the capital behind it uh, in order for it to be successful. And uh, David Lewis, who you're going to meet in a minute, and AT&T, they're our, our latest early adopters who's stepping up to, to provide $50,000 to make sure that the kids are a career startup uh, and a homeowner ready. So with, uh, without any further ado, I want to thank you guys for, for being here again. And I want to introduce you to our program partners, Deviate, who have really worked with the, the youth on their design. Um, Cassidy and Kelsey, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sean. And thanks everyone, um, you guys did such a good job. So thank you to the panelists and thank you to our youth moderators. Um, that was awesome, you guys killed it. And it was so uh, great to listen to what you guys had to say and we definitely learned a lot, so kudos. Um, my name is Cassidy Tucker and I'm co-founder of Deviate. My name is Kelsey Tucker and I'm co-founder and creative director of Deviate. And um, as Sean mentioned, we're working with the Boys and Girls Club to um, launched the fashion design program that's a part of the industry club. And we have actually been working with um, students that are part of the first inaugural cohort of the fashion design program. And they've done such a good job of working on their t-shirt designs over the last three weeks. They've been working really hard every single day. Um, we know a number of them have even taken their designs home and been locking themselves in closets to finish it in time. So um, great job to everyone for working so hard. Not only the kids who are in the fashion design program, but also to all of the youth members who are watching from um, Wilson, Dill, uh, Doubt Club. Um, you guys killed it. So thank you for working so hard and you should all be really proud of the work that you produce because it is definitely impactful. And um, I think all of the judges will be able to attest to it it was a really difficult decision. You guys made us chat for a while, so um, good job. And everyone should be proud of themselves. Um, with that, I think we can start to run through the designs um, so we can pull up the presentation. And if you guys uh, joined the Zoom early, you would have seen the presentation kind of looping through um, to see some of the designs that have been turned in um, on Friday. So let's see if the screen will come up. So I'm Christian, this is Leon. Here's our design for Reimagining America. So these five roadblocks represent the past, the future, and the present. These two, slavery, slavery, um, 1558 and Jim Crow, 1865, and racism 2020, this roadblock, we're, break, we're breaking through to march towards a better tomorrow. And these, uh, two, these other two are, are the future, equality and justice are unknown as the, we put question marks because we don't know how close that could be our near future. And basically, um, the city represents us walking to a better tomorrow in the pursuit of a of true freedom. So basically it's just 
plus B, forward thinking and educational of the past and the present and future of social injustice that African Americans have faced. Okay, so the two right here on my left, the color of gray represents the racism we had dealt with in the past, as in like Jim Crow and slavery. And we chose the American flag for racism 2020 because it's what we're dealing with right now as America is broken, the system. Yes, and systematic racism. And these two on my right here, they represent what we're going to go through into the future. And we don't know what that is yet because we haven't really gotten to it yet. And the yellow represents our path toward happiness and pursuit of, in pursuit of our true freedom so that we can all, you know, feel, feel a good emotion on the inside. And also, also the city supposed to be like in the future. In the future, of what African American African American supposed to go through? Like we no longer have to live in fear or be judged of our skin tone or be be abused or murdered, and, and just not be oppressed no longer by the oppressor, basically. So that was Chris and Leon. Um, as you can see, their video or their design um, was was a hopeful design. Um, you know, walking through the education of um, the history of racism in our country and that hope for a better future and working towards um, that pursuit of true freedom. And um, we're really proud of Chris and Leon for working so hard on their on their design. So great job, you guys. And we'll move on to the next video. Hi, I'm Kenzie. I'm Maddie. And this is our design. So for the placement, this is going to be in the middle of the shirt. These two words are going to go on the sleeves of the shirt. And this is going to be on the back, the little confidence booster. So basically with our design, we put unapologetically black on her eyes because that's how she sees herself. And it kind of seems like America, they want us to regret being black and being our culture being too dark, too light, having too big a hair, too big of lips. And we just wanted to show a black person that was confident in the way she was with her hair, her big lips and her skin color. And for her earrings, we put them as the American flag because we wanted to show that instead of us being the product of America, America was our product. And for the quote, it says, I am dripping, uh, dripping melon and honey. I am black without apology. And we thought that would go with the unapologetically black and be a little confidence booster. So for these words, we wanted to put strong and bold because we wanted that to represent our design and we wanted our design to show that we are strong and we are bold. For this tag right here, it says um, powerful black woman and this tag is supposed to represent that back in slavery when they um, were selling slaves, they would put tags on us to like say our name and stuff. And we wanted to put a twist on it to put a positive energy on this negative thing. And um, for the number, it's the year that they started selling slaves. And also for these lines, it's called contrast, contrast stitching, and it's going to go on the seams of the shirt. Um, we picked blue because it's, it means powerful and bold and strong, and we thought that went really, really well. We are so proud of the sister team, Maddie and Mackenzie. Um, they absolutely killed it. They made the decision, everyone in the groups made the decision so hard. Um, we really love that they thought everything through um, on every part of the t-shirt and um, learned about contrast stitching, which is really cool. So good job. All right, next. Uh, my name is Mikaela. My name is Amira. My name is Erica. My name is Umar. And the theme of our shirt is social justice. So basically, our hands represent equality. So we have one for Caucasian, Hispanic, African American, uh, -American LGBTQ. And um, the blood coming out of the hands represents that we all believe the same. So that's why I like the thorns coming out of the uh, the rose. And you want me to explain the rose? Uh, pretty much the rose means different things to uh, different people. 
Um, it can mean happy things, sad things, but for us right now, it's the thorns right now. It, we all bleed the same, we're all the same. And right now people don't really recognize that right now. So this is our way of showing people that we all bleed the same. For the power together and justice over there, for the vines going through it, um, meaning it all ties together. We all are power when we're all together and justice as a unity. And you can't have, you can't have, we all believe the same without power because they all ties together. Um, we chose the design of social justice and the definition at the bottom, um, mainly because we wanted something different. So we took like the idea off of Google. So when you go on Google, you look up what does social justice mean and then you get this type of outline. And we didn't want to take all the definition out, so we just kind of simplified it to what we understood. We mm -hmm. modified it and we chose the colors. Well, we chose the salmon color because it's not it's not a color you really see on most shirts. And then the beige color is like a unisex color and it's not a color you see too. So we just chose outside. We were just thinking outside of the box and chose different things. And our heart and our smelly Christ, you want to explain it? My display of the strong fan in the hall goes to the strong place so happiness and to keep the healthy and the hall show of breaking that heart broken because the uh, feel like the world is falling apart and people dying. So if you couldn't hear him, he said our heart represents like the world, how we not together and how it's falling apart. And the red, as she said, it represents different things. So it can mean heartbreak or it can mean unity. And our smiley face means peace. So we just want peace and unity peace and positivity. And that's our project. This group did an amazing job as well. Um, the judges really loved, um, one, the salmon color. They thought that it was really unique and different. Um, they loved the vibe of the antique vibe with the um, oval circle in the middle, as well as the um, smiley face graphic and the heart graphic. They thought that that could work really well on a t-shirt. So really great job, you guys. Now for the last video. The shirt is white is because she's um, yeah, her angel is because like she got the shirt and the little halo is here. And it's a flag over her mouth because it's basically said that America has silenced America. Amer Americans will stop from like speaking up for themselves. All right, so over here. We put words in the hair to represent the things you want to have in the world, to for the clothes, be the things you wish to see. So we put clothes like equality, um, freedom, leadership, love, things that will make this world a better place, a better place. And for the crown down there, we put the crown there to represent the empowerment that every person has and every person can bring to the world. All right, so this, like the design that's on her shirt was our original design. So each one of these is supposed to be a timeline. So this is supposed to represent how America is putting black people in jail. And then this is supposed to represent how many people were in jail in the 1990s. This one represents the three strikes you're out. So every, it was 402,000 people that had to come out of jail every month for the people that got three strikes to go into jail. And they stayed in there for life. This is supposed to represent war against drugs. It was really supposed to be a, a war against black people. So that's why it's the blood dripping down because it's supposed to be the blood of black people. And this is supposed to represent the Black Panther because white people killed the Black Panther. And also, in like in movies, they always said that the black person was supposed to be represented by a beast. So instead of putting a person, I put a Black Panther. Yeah. All right. Great job, Riera, Jayla, and Ronnie. Um, the judges really loved your, your attention to detail. Um, you really like prove the or hit the concept of social justice um, on the head. So that was a really great. They love the symbolism and the, the shirt within the shirt. Also, just the real attention to detail with the little crown in the middle of the hand. So really great job, you guys.
So as you can see, we had a very difficult decision to make, and um, that was just four of the 13 teams that um, submitted applications. So again, shout out to all the youth members from various clubs, Dill, Dauk, um, Wilson, you guys did great. So good job. Um, and I guess we can announce the winner now. Okay. So we have a first place, a second place, and a third place. The first place gets $1,500. The second place gets $500. And the third place gets $250. So our first place winners, they're actually sitting right behind us. So I'm excited to hear the celebration. It is Riera, Jayla, and Ronnie. Not sure if you guys can hear that, but they're pretty excited. Um, in second place, we have Kanila and Xavier. Um, in the slideshow, they had the blue, um, the blue painting with the hearts in the sky and the clouds and the fists up in the air. And the point of theirs was really all about recognizing the lives that have been lost to social justice and police brutality and the families that still remain who um, miss their loved ones. So we thought that was really beautiful. And in third place, we have Josh and Dominic. There was in the slide was the, the hand that also um, interpret or was a represented a tree trunk. And um, just to show that we all come from the same roots, we thought that was really amazing. So great job to all of our winners. And with that, we are actually going to hand this off to David Lewis, the president of AT&T Michigan, um, to hand the check to the winner. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Great job and you're all winners. So thank you, Brother Sean, members of the Board of Directors, panelists, staff, and volunteers for all that you do for the Boys and Girls Club of Southeastern Michigan. But more importantly, good evening to the innovators of today, leaders of tomorrow, game changers who fear no one. I salute you. Why? Because you have chosen the path less followed. What path is that? The path that is, the path that is never easy. It's steep. It's complicated, it's difficult, frustrating, and in some cases, deemed impossible. But in the words of Jay-Z, difficult takes a day, impossible takes a week. We at at and are humbled to be an early adopter to support the growth and development of the world's first industry club with Boys and Girls Club of Southeastern Michigan. The $50,000 donation from at and will support the innovative work Boys and Girls Club of Southeastern Michigan is doing through the Industry Club program. This is just the beginning of a long impactful relationship to continue supporting youth throughout Southeastern Michigan. It is great to experience and celebrate not only the creativity of our youth, but to hear their voices and ideas around social justice and injustice and how it's impacting them. It's very powerful. So this, this We Design To design competition elevates the voices of our youth and ensures they understand no matter where they come from, they can become the next major designer. And that's what at and Believe Detroit is all about. We support you. We are investing in you. This is about you. By applying our time, talent, and treasures in places and people, we, where we live, work, and raise our families, we are investing in you. The question is, do you believe? So I'm honored to present this $1,500 check to the winner that was just announced. So Anthony's here is the check. I'm going to hand it to you to give to the winners. Um, I just want to say thank you for giving us this chance to be able to do this. I appreciate all y'all that took the chance on me. Don't be having no face. Um, I like to say thank you. I'm glad I won this. I'm glad I was able to work with them. 
Yeah, but it went fifteen hundred dollars. You know, treat on me. All y'all get yourself. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited. <laughs> I don't get so nervous. Right, say bye. Say bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>